Excellent. Uh, and apologies for showing up late for the meeting. That was on purpose. I had to teach on Monday night. I left immediately after my class so I could be here as soon as possible. It sounds like it's a, it's a fantastic workshop in terms of what everybody's doing and how much interest everybody has in the same topics. So I'm going to talk about what I hear a lot of uh, people talk about during discussions and during their presentations is this idea that we want to get inside the black box. It's nice to be able to measure the impacts of uh, policies and programs on outcomes, and we're spending a lot of time talking about these rival explanations that can mask or mimic the impacts that we're trying to do and how we might try to block them or control for them. But people are simply unsatisfied with average treatment effects on the treated and these sort of average kinds of uh, marginal treatment effects that we might be measuring and want to get inside and think about under what conditions do these programs and policies work best? And through what mechanisms are they operating? Do you have some sense of knowing that uh, what's inside that black box might help us? So, and before I get started, I want to just make sure that we're clear on definitions or words that I'm going to use. So if there's some confusion in the literature, people use words differently. So I'm going to use two words, moderator and mechanism. And what I mean by moderator is a variable that's unaffected by the treatment and moderates the treatment effect depending on its value. Right? So what we're talking about there is things that give rise to heterogeneous treatment effects, so that the program is more effective in communities that were poorer at a baseline. The program is more effective in reducing deforestation in flat lands or highly agriculturally productive lands. Those are what I mean by moderators. And mechanisms, I'm talking about a variable that's affected by the treatment and in turn affects the outcome. It's this intermediate outcome on the causal pathway. Often in the literature you'll see uh, the word mediator used, and it's used in both ways. You can talk about mediators as mechanisms and mediators as moderators, so I'm not going to use the word mediator because it leads to too much confusion. But mechanisms, corruption was one we heard about just in the previous presentation, how the, you know, protected areas might generate tourism business opportunities, all these sorts of programs might change ecosystem services that might lead to other changes in human welfare. Those are the kind of mechanisms uh, I'm talking about. And there's the, the thing I want to put right in the beginning uh, is that one of the big things that we've learned from the revolution in causal inference, and really been known for a long time, but it's really been emphasized in the last two decades, is that you can't get causal effects from data alone. We don't let the data speak. The data do not speak. That every kind of impact evaluation relies on untestable assumptions that hopefully come from theory. I heard Alex was pushing stories yesterday and having theory. Uh, and often these assumptions are incredible, meaning they're hard to believe. And so I'm going to talk about heterogeneous impacts and mechanisms. In this case, we have even more untestable assumptions, and they're even more incredible, even harder to believe in the assumptions that we've been using just to try to measure average impacts. And if I don't, I'm going to try to hammer on that. If I don't hammer on it enough, I wanted to put it right up in front so everybody's clear uh, uh, on that. And there's three lessons I want to push today. Uh, one is the one I just talked about, is that to get at heterogeneous treatment effects, to get at mechanisms, to acquire even more assumptions than we've had before for average effects, and these are even harder to believe uh, than the ones that we're already using. There's different ways to think about heterogeneous treatment effects and mechanism effects. So even when we say those words, lots of times people are using them differently. And there's a big debate now in, uh, in the statistical world about what is a mechanism effect and how to best conceptualize it. I'm going to talk about one way. And, um, and just a reminder, our work isn't done after estimating the effect. We've got to prosecute these untestable assumptions. They're untestable, we can't test them, but we can get at them in indirect ways and see how important are they, what happens if I relax those assumptions a little bit, and what if I'm wrong? What if there is some sort of hidden bias in my analysis? These sorts of post-estimation procedures are going to be even more important when talking about heterogeneity and we're talking about mechanisms. Heterogeneity analyses and mechanism analyses aren't just analysts at the very end of your paper. We have a small section on heterogeneity and mechanism. They are studies in themselves. They can't be effectively done as just an add-on. Uh, if you're able to stick it in with a couple of paragraphs at the end with a bunch of interaction terms, you're probably not doing uh, justice to, to the subject. And then I put a bunch of lists of things down at the bottom there that you might want to uh, do. All right, so let's start with heterogeneity. Why do we care about heterogeneity? There might be other reasons, but here are three 
uh, important ones. One is developing what Mansky fancifully calls uh, conditional empirical success rules. This is basically the idea of where does it work best? When you get no effect, where does it get a perverse effect? Because we have that information, we can do better targeting, condition our treatment assignment on observable characteristics, and therefore make our program more cost effective, and more or less the same idea, but just bringing it out a little bit more, is avoiding harm in certain areas. Right? So that's one thing, so that we understand where it works best, where it does not, we're going to have more effective programs. If we examine the impacts on more than one effect, so look at the impacts on environmental outcomes and poverty, like Daniela was doing, we then understand the heterogeneity, we can start looking at trade-offs. If the areas where we get the biggest environmental bang, the same areas where we get the biggest poverty reduction bang, or there seems to be trade-offs. If you want to really reduce poverty in protected areas, you're going into areas where you won't get as big of an environmental gain or, or vice versa. And the last one, is I heard yesterday people talking about, well, you've got this one study, and I think the, the early presentation talked about, you've got this one study, what does it mean for other areas? Understanding heterogeneity, right, this only works very well for extremely poor people, and then I go to an area where there aren't extremely poor people, well, then I might have some sense that maybe this program won't work there. So understanding what kinds of areas respond best to uh, particular programs or worse will help us extrapolate to new areas, sort of external validity problem that um, plagues a lot of the analyses that we do. We focus on internal validity. Is this really a causal relationship? But there's still the problem that even if it is a causal relationship here, does it carry over to other areas? All right, one thing I just want to mention, I because heterogeneity again is sort of um, used in different ways. People often use it, and I realize it when I look at this paper that we use it in the table later, which I wish we didn't. Well, so this is what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about where the treatment is simply unpacked into uh, different ways of implementing. So here's an example from a paper, Environmental Resource Letters, where, and, and Alex Math has done this, we start to break down and I've seen more papers doing this. David Gavo has done this for Indonesia, and I know Danielle is doing it in her, her work. Where you start breaking down protection. You've got sustainable use areas, you've got wildlife areas, strictly protected areas, and you're unpacking that and looking at the heterogeneity of different ways of implementing the same construct, right, of protection. Or PS, it might be PS that are based on cash transfers, or PS that's based on in-kind transfers. And when you're doing that, you're basically just getting multi-value treatments. And all you can do, you've got a bunch of different counterfactuals and a bunch of different contrasts that you can do. That's not the kind of heterogeneity I want to talk about today, although it's still important and interesting. The kind I want to talk about today is where you're looking at one treatment and how its impacts vary conditional and observable characteristics. And even that is not precise enough, because there's two ways to think about this kind of heterogeneity. So here's an example that's looking at the impacts of protected areas in Costa Rica uh, on poverty. This is socioeconomic, but it's on poverty. It just splits uh, for a bunch of observable characteristics, land use capacity, slope, percent, distance to major city, baseline poverty, percentage of agricultural workers at baseline high, above the median, below the median. So two subgroups. So if you look at the first one, land use capacity, what that says is that for the light bar, that's the high land use capacity. Protection seems to exacerbate poverty. It's going in the, the downward direction. So upward is increasing poverty reduction. That's, when I realize when I read that, that's a terrible way of phrasing it. Uh, but anyway, uh, when you, so when you put a protection onto high capacity land, you seem to be exacerbating poverty, although it's not statistically significant. You can see the error bars. But when you put protection on low capacity lands that are not very good for agriculture, you seem to get a poverty reduction uh, effect. And it's reasonably uh, large and statistically different from zero. Right, but this is not controlling for other things. This is just looking in the subgroup of low capacity land versus high capacity land with all the other things that might be correlated with low capacity land and high capacity land. All right, so the one time when you hear about heterogeneity, you need to be clarifying, are we just talking about subgroups, things we can observe? I can observe really good land for agriculture and really bad land for agriculture. I want to know the differential uh, treatment effects from protection or PES or community forest management on those different kinds of lands. And it's not, I don't care particularly about what is it about high agricultural land that makes this response. I just want to see it 
uh, to see if they're more responsive, because that's what I can observe, that might be a politically relevant variable or something like that. So that's one uh, way to do it, right? And, and these are conditional average treatment effects of the treated that I have here, but not controlling for any other factors. I just have a, um, a parenthetical statement there. Um, you know, so we go through a lot of rigor mode to estimate these. And I remember getting a, a, a question once in the center, why don't you just do a regression with a bunch of interaction terms? Right? You know, you interact the treatment with a bunch of the observable covariates. And the reason we don't do that um, is because we're trying to get the average treatment effect on the treated conditional on these. And regression is not going to quite give you that same thing when you have causal effect heterogeneity and when you have severe covariate imbalance between the treatment and the control groups. It's the same reason why you might want to do matching instead of regression. When you have causal effect heterogeneity and you've got severe covariate imbalance, you're not, the weighting on the regression can be completely different from the weighting, in most cases, from the weighting you want to get for the particular estimate that you're, you're looking for. But I'm not, this is not a methods uh, seminar, so I don't want to belabor that too much. Um, and then, the, before I go on, then the interesting thing you can do is this sort of comparison. So here is the same subgroup effects on the left for deforestation. We already saw what's on the right. And what we can look at here is, are we getting the same responses from protection for those areas that are, uh, that are observably different for avoided deforestation and for uh, poverty? And the first thing you can just sort of see is on the, the land use capacity one, the one we talked about before, the big avoided deforestation comes from the areas that are highly productive for agriculture. What you'd expect, the stuff that's flat land, the stuff that's good for agriculture, that's the stuff where if you protect it, you're going to get a lot of avoided deforestation, but that's where we sit on the other side, where you're not going to get poverty reduction, you might get poverty exacerbation. So in that sense, trying to target, there might be some trade-offs there that you would have to address. So this is just looking at subgroups individually, but then you might say, well, I want to know the, how protection varies with these characteristics, holding the other characteristics constant. I want to tease out the heterogeneity that comes from just that particular component. Right? So that's a different kind of heterogeneous effect. I'm not exactly sure this is the one we want to go after, um, although I have uh, published work on it. Uh, because generally this is not something that practitioners are going to do. They're not going to be able to do this sort of, this is a fancy partial linear modeling where we holding constant uh, everything else, we're looking at how protection affects avoided deforestation in the green and poverty uh, in the red where uh, poverty is reducing by going up as a function of how slow, and the bigger the number, the steeper the land. So what you're seeing here is in the green, that what we saw before is that holding constant all these other characteristics, as the slope gets steeper, we're getting less avoided deforestation. And as the slope gets steeper, we're getting more poverty reduction. All right, so again, showing this tension that between the environmental and the poverty goals, although we don't necessarily see it with all of the uh, characteristics of heterogeneity. So different ways of looking at heter heterogeneity, and just the make a point, this is why it's important that we don't do global analyses, that we look at heterogeneity across the world, within countries, within, with, across countries, within countries, because here's the same graph for slope for Bolivia, and it looks completely different from what it looked like for Costa Rica, right? Uh, and in terms of some of the ways those curves operate. And so it just goes to show, again, what I think I heard yesterday, people talking about how we need to build up the evidence base to lots of cases, not just assume because something happened here in Mexico or something happened here in Costa Rica necessarily corresponds to what's going to happen in Tanzania or what's going to happen in, in, a, in Malawi. All right, and then the one thing that the partial linear modeling or holding constant all the other characteristics, looking at how heterogeneous the treatment effects are, is that then you can start combining these different characteristics to get a sense of put it in a map or you can do it other ways of you know where would for a particular kind of treatment where are the areas most suitable given I'm trying to get these kinds of outcomes. Maybe one outcome in this one we have poverty and avoiding deforestation 
and we can sort of highlight the policymakers. In the yellow, it's sort of that win-win areas where we're getting both avoiding deforestation and poverty reduction based on the characteristics. The black areas will be no-go areas if you're worried about poverty exacerbation. So by figuring out, teasing out the heterogeneity according to each different component you can observe. Again, these are not causally related, these are just associated still. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that I can, I'm, I'm holding constant all the other relevant factors that might uh, moderate my treatment effect. I'm just holding out the other ones that I can observe constant. And then I can sort of tease out on the landscape how, based on historical impact, how uh, areas might respond to new uh, treatment assignments. Right. But the thing I want to emphasize is this kind of work is incredibly dangerous. What I mean by dangerous is we can fool ourselves into coming up with some really clear stories that we, we, can, we can create a narrative about, uh, and they're completely false. And in medicine, this has been a debate for decades. And I don't know if you know that in medical trials for drugs, if you don't randomize within the subgroups, you don't get to make claims that are going to be FDA approved about subgroup uh, heterogeneity and males respond more than females, or this is much better for white racial groups compared to black racial groups. Because it's too easy, they realize, to come up with impacts if you start looking for enough subgroups. You cut up the data in enough subgroups, you're going to come up with an impact, and particularly what you're not allowed to do in medical trials is to say there's no average effect. Well, when I start looking into subgroups, I find that white females between the ages of 20 and 35, they respond to the drug, and the other groups, they don't respond to the drug. It's not allowed. Uh, but people still do subgroup analysis, and this was a recent meta-review in the British Medical Journal, a good medical journal, looking at how, now these are not, these are not like a regulatory approved RCTs, these are RCTs that are being published in the scholarly literature, uh, what people were doing, and they're arguing that a lot of people are looking at subgroups, and most of them are doing it in a way that is not to be believed, incredibly weak. Uh, and the, the, they also write at the, at the end, it says, it is perhaps not surprising that many inferences from subgroup analysis have proved spurious. So where they've gone back and they've done an RCT with those subgroups, where they randomized within the subgroups, and they showed that there was no effect uh, from the treatment. And why is it a problem? It's because it's hard enough to get these as-if random assignments. Once I condition on these characteristics, then with matching and regression, treatment is as-if randomly assigned. Or once I condition and throw in an instrument that for the complier population, treatment is as-if randomly assigned, right? There's no more confounding. That's hard enough to get for the population we're studying. But now we're starting to say with, within higher agricultural productivity areas, that's true. Within low productivity areas, that's true. And within high slope and low slope and within poor at baseline and not poor at baseline and with you know, far from roads and close to roads. In each of these subgroups, these as if random assumptions that we're claiming to draw causal inferences are accurate. That's really much harder to believe. So, is that not? really, but my numbering system is sort of vague. So I try to come up with guidelines uh, based on my reading of that literature and my own experience doing heterogeneity. And you can look at my articles and you'll say, I, don't do, I haven't done all of these in one. And that's so, I, I'm not saying that I'm perfect and, and everybody should do this. This is what I think I'm aspiring to do uh, when it comes to uh, how to do heterogeneous analysis. The first thing, this is from the medical literature, from everybody's literature, Select a small number of theoretically motivated and policy relevant subgroups in advance. That's not something you don't start doing afterward where you say, well, I've got a bunch of other data, let's check out that and see if there's any subgroup effects within this other stuff that I've been able to get. You pick them in advance, small, I put it, I don't know what small is, but small is usually four or five. And often in medical trials, there's two or one uh, that they allow. Right? And it doesn't have to be in the theory of the or policy relevant, just means that that's what the policymaker cares about, poor versus rich. And so that's what you want to look at, for example. If you're doing an RCT, try to randomize within the pre-selected subgroups, but a lot of us are not doing RCT, we don't have this luxury, so otherwise, be particularly wary of doing heterogeneous analysis if you have the unconditional, I'm assuming most of you are estimating the average treatment effect on the treated, usually that's the most relevant and easiest to do, Ah, yeah, when it's zero. And if you're going to do that, you want to try to conduct. So if you've got a zero average effect, you're saying that maybe for some subgroups, 
this program is effective, you want to try to do some kind of null hypothesis of a conditional uh, ATT equal to zero. There's one in the Review of uh, Economics and Statistics by Crump et al., uh, where you're not actually identifying the nature of that heterogeneity. You're first just asking, does it exist? It's sort of an omnibus test. And then even after, you should be skeptical, really skeptical of any results that you get or, or read about from anybody else in that sort of analysis. If you can reject that the ATT is equal to zero, first thing to do is a joint test. Again, not trying to identify subgroup impacts right off the bat, but just asking, is there some kind of heterogeneity, right? So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And if you were doing interactions in a, in a, a regression, you can do an F test. Uh, the same article in Review of Economics and Statistics has this no of a constant conditional average treatment effect. Uh, Quantile treatment effects have to be combined with this rank preservation assumption. That's another way to sort of just look at is there heterogeneity without trying to identify the nature of it first. Uh, and then start considering individual subgroup treatments. Uh, and I would suggest first doing it without the sort of partialing out the effects of other things. Just first to see is there an impact within these different subgroups, right? Males versus females, with all the other things that might be correlated with them. Males have more physical capital or something like that. Um, and then move on to the sort of holding everything else constant. I want to look at the heterogeneity of one particular subgroup. Uh, if you're doing multiple subgroup testing, a big thing in the statistics literature is uh, uh, maintaining a constant family-wise type error rate. You can't just do you know, 12, 15 different hypothesis tests and claim that your p-values are still exactly what they are that come out of your statistical program that's wrong. Those are, that's not the, I mean, something you keep doing repeated hypothesis tests and you're bound to find some low p-values just by chance and you've got to adjust the type 1 error rate. We should be doing these sensitivity tests and tests of known effects after. What if we're wrong? What if there is unobservable heterogeneity within these subgroups uh, that's correlated with both treatment and outcome? And then at the very end, just remember, these results are just less credible than the average results. Don't go, often people, this is what people really want. They want the heterogeneity, they want the subgroups. I mean, that's stuff they grab and run with. Um, but that's stuff that is the stuff they should be walking with, not running with, because that's the stuff that's least credible from the analyses uh, that we do. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but this is just a paper from an experiment we did. We looked at subgroup impacts. And the first thing we did is that we didn't randomize between these subgroups. So the first thing we want to do is show that in these subgroups, the pre-treatment outcomes were not statistically different, right? So it's not a, it's an indirect test showing that even though I didn't randomize between these subgroups, I should see their pre-treatment outcomes being exactly the same within these subgroups across my treatment and control arms. If I don't see that, I'd be concerned. All right, so the, the rest of the time I want to talk about the mechanisms, all right? mechanisms, intermediate variables. Why do we want them? Because we have the sense of that if we knew what the mechanisms were, how these things work, right, or how they fail to work, that we could design better programs, programs that boost the, the positive aspects of the mechanisms and mitigate the negative as aspects of the mechanisms. So I'm going to give you an actual concrete example of how of identifying mechanisms. So this is from a paper in uh, for students of National Academy of Science in 2010, where we looked at the effect of protected areas in Costa Rica and Thailand, I'm just going to look at the Costa Rica results, on poverty. When you don't control for baseline poverty and a bunch of other confounders, it looks like protection is increasing poverty. It's going in the, that blue uh, direction going up. But once you control for confounders, it looks like poverty is being reduced uh, in the areas about a about a fifth of a standard deviation. And if you believe that result, the next question you might want to ask after you look at heterogeneity is how? How did poverty get reduced? You might have hypotheses about different mechanisms that come from theory or experience. And you might want to decompose that causal effect into its constituent mechanism effects. Right? And so what, what we wanted to look at is we say, OK, out there in, in practice, Theory might think of protected areas affecting ecosystem services. They're called generates tourism. It changes land cover. That might affect ecosystem services. It might also affect infrastructure, change the nature of roads. It might change the nature of schools and clinics. Uh, and so we want to sort of look at if we can identify how much of that protected area impact is coming from these different mechanisms. So the original analysis basically said, OK, D is protection, Y is poverty. 
I worry about these X's that are causing uh, wear protection is being cited that also affect poverty. They're putting protection where poor people already are, they're far from roads, on poor soil. I want to block those and then just assume away this U, these unobserved things that affect protection and the outcomes, and of course, all these other things that affect poverty, I don't have to worry about uh, because as long as they're not correlated with uh, protection. Mechanisms is going to make that more elaborate. So before I show that graph, I want to talk about what those mechanisms that we want to look at are. Uh, Tourism-related opportunities, infrastructure, and then ecosystem services and foregone productive activities related to land use change. So we can see that there's additional regeneration of forests or avoided deforestation, but we're not going to be able to tease out what's coming from hydrological services, what's coming from pollination. And the same problem with a lot of these ecosystem service studies is the same treatment that you use to generate more ecosystem services and also stop people from using the forest and extracting fuel wood and agriculture and other things. And trying to tease all of those out is, is quite difficult, even if you had the data, but we don't. And then if you want to do the study, you have to be able to observe the mechanisms. Right? And I want to, we can debate later, but we're just going to use park entrances for, as a proxy for tourism that we got from Alex's collaborator, Juan Robolino and his colleagues. Uh, road networks, clinics, schools, and forest cover. These are things that we have baseline values for, pre-protection and post-protection <laughs> values. And now this is what we've got to do. We've got this now elaborated causal pathway with these mechanisms intermediate. And I've got to worry about confounding variables that affect protection, the mechanisms, and poverty. And I've got to block the influence of those. And if you look at this, what we've got is essentially a two-step procedure. So I've seen a lot of people talk about mechanisms where they're just saying, okay, I'm going to get protection's impact on roads. And I see it has an effect. I'm going to then, then I'm going to claim there's a connection between infrastructure development and, and poverty, between roads and poverty. But here we want to get the whole thing, right? And so it's going to require some kind of two-step procedure to first clarify the effect of protection on the mechanism, and second to clarify the effect of the mechanism on poverty, right? How to do that. Uh, and the other thing is that in order to do this, the mechanisms have to be isolated. I mean, I still have to worry about confounding, a line that goes from variables that also affect poverty or protection that also go to the mechanism. So it's making it more difficult uh, to isolate these, these impacts. Uh, conceptually, I only have a few minutes left, four minutes left. I want to just um, talk about what a mechanism effect is conceptually. Right? So here's the counterfactual question. What would poverty in the treated tracks have been like? The tracks are, are census tracks. Have the treated tracks been protected, but protection not affected the mechanism? All right, so to give you a thought experiment to help uh, make this more concrete. All right, suppose we randomly assign PAs, protected areas, to test their average effect on poverty in communities. What part of that effect is to the changes in forest cover? Let's pick one of those, those mechanisms, changes in land use. I, ideally, you would run a new experiment in which the new treatment is the same as the original one, same protection, but we block the effect of land use change by holding the forest cover, if it's a forest community, at the level it would have been if the area were a control area under the original experiment. So we let everything go on as it would in the experiment, but we don't allow land cover to be affected. We let it to go on just what it would be uh, during it. So you know, a way to think about it is that the guards wouldn't stop people from clearing the land or, or doing anything else, right? So let's say an area is protected, it has experienced a deforestation of 10 hectares, and under the control condition, it experiences a deforestation of 200 hectares. We're asking, we're talking about the mechanism effect of land use change. What would poverty in the community look like had there been a protected area, but instead of 10 hectares of deforestation, it experienced 200 hectares of deforestation. So let all the other mechanisms play out the way they were going to play out, but stop that one mechanism of land use change. That difference between the impact with all the mechanisms in play and the impact with one mechanism taken out is the mechanism effect of forest cover on poverty that comes through protection. Right? And the, why is this difficult? Right? Now we have more counterfactuals to worry about, more potential outcomes to worry about. Right? So we've got M is the mechanism. Right? We've got a, a situation where we have the mechanism under protection and we have the mechanism under the control condition. 
And we have two potential values. For every unit out there, we have two potential poverty outcomes, with and without protection, and two potential mechanism vari variables, one with and without protection. Uh, with the time, I'm not going to talk about these potential outcomes, but the, the key idea is that the thing in the middle is what I'm missing. I, uh, or actually, the thing at the bottom is what I'm missing. I need to know what would poverty look like with protection, but with the mechanism value as it would have been without protection. And I can't observe that. And I can see what poverty looks like with protection with the mechanism value that comes from protection. I can see what poverty looks like without protection and the mechanism value without uh, protection. But I can't see this counterfactual, and that's what you have to spend your time working on. Because right, the average treatment effect on the treatment is what's already been estimated, and a lot of you are estimating. This is the mechanism average treatment effect. It's the expected poverty with protection with the mechanism value that it has with protection minus the expected poverty with protection but without the mechanism, with the mechanism of the control condition for all those units that actually get protection and have their mechanism values that they would be. Right, so this, you know, this the counterfactual language, all these potential outcomes, it's hard to get your head around. This is not making it easier in a really short presentation. But I'm trying to get some sense to you of that mechanism effects are complicated to think about. And you need to be really careful and think about it carefully, what you're doing. And the other issue is that we're never going to be able to think of all the possible mechanisms or observe them in all their dimensions and all their glory. And so you need an approach that's going to allow you to say, I can measure individual mechanism effects, and then there's going to be some residual, something left over of unexplained mechanism effect. It's here it's called the net average treatment effect on the treated, that is all other mechanisms are all unobservable dimensions of mechanisms. So with my last second, even though I'm one minute over, I'm going to give you what the punchline is. So this is what the results look like from the mechanism analysis. All right, so what we have is that same causal pathway, Protection on the left, poverty is there on the, on the right. And we've got the three different causal pathways we're interested in, and then the one at the bottom, that dotted line, is that net average treatment effect. It's what we can't observe. And what we're seeing is that protection increases the amount of tourism, right? It increases these park entrances. It in decreases the roadless uh, volume, meaning that it adds to infrastructure development. I didn't put the clinics in. Uh, schools up here, but it's the same results that we get for roads. And it increases the amount of forest cover, both reduces avoided deforestation and increases regeneration. We have in the middle the actual treatment effects themselves on the mechanisms. So we put up the observed value and the counterfactual value. So in the bottom one, forest cover was 5.8% uh, increase, uh, sorry, decrease, it's a negative value, in the treated values, but it would have been 16.5% reduction in the counterfactual. And then the second stage, you have to estimate the impact of a one unit change of forest cover on poverty. And then we have to combine those two at the end to show how that effect, I don't have a laser point here, maybe I do it right here. This is the effect that Anthem et al. found, a minus 2.39 reduction in this asset poverty index that they had. And we're trying to decompose that into its constituents, right, based on this two-step procedure. And what you're basically seeing here is the punchline is almost all of that effect, about two-thirds of it, or 70% of it, is coming from the tourism. Right? The rest of it is small and naive, and the rest of it that we can't account for, the reduction, is coming from mechanisms that we can't observe, or dimensions of these mechanisms that we can't actually measure uh, directly. Right, so there's lots of other things that people are doing that change other than forest cover in terms of the landscape. There's lots of things that we're not capturing with tourism, but like looking at the park entrances, where they're going in. Uh, and there's lots of aspects of infrastructure that we're not getting, just looking at roads, schools, and clinics. But this is the basic idea, is to try to elaborate the causal pathway and then to um, estimate the impacts all along that pathway. And with that, I'll open it up to questions.